think I am live now. So hello, everyone. I'm Tarana. And welcome to the keynote, our first keynote session with Professor Wolzinger. Uh, before going into talking about him, who does not need a lot of introduction, I will just tell a few technical things. Uh, please feel free to ask questions using the ask a question feature, which is on the bottom. And please also indicate whether you want to be invited on the screen or not for it. And also remember to upload other questions. So with this, I will introduce Professor Zinger. He is a director emeritus at the Max Planck Institute for uh, Brain Research in Frankfurt, and is also the founding director for both Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies and the Ernst Strongman Institute. His research focuses on the neuronal substrate of higher cognitive functions, and especially on the question of how distributed sub-processes in the brain are coordinated and bound together in order to give rise to coherent perception and action. With this, I hand over to Professor Singer. Thank you, Tarana. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. This is quite a new experience for me to talk to my screen. And I don't see myself. I don't see you. All I see is my boring PowerPoints. So bear with me if it is a little bit strange. Um, I want to share with you some ideas on uh, cortical computations, especially computations that exploit the high dimensional state space that emerges from the complex interactions in cortical networks. And I will subdivide my talk into two parts. <clears throat> Both will focus on the encoding of relation. The first is um, a proposal of how recurrent networks could be exploited in order to dynamically encode relations among features or components of objects. And in the second part, I will uh, discuss some more interesting, perhaps, properties that uh, are derived from the dynamics of recurrent networks, especially the extremely high dimensional state space that is created by the dynamics of uh, reciprocal interactions. So. Um, I will start with a, a more general remark. Uh, the world is, has a profound modular structure. It's a little bit like a Lego principle. Remind you that less than 100 atoms suffice to generate the virtually infinite diversity of objects. And the 28 symbols of the Latin alphabet, at least, suffice to compose the world literature. So cognitive systems that need to deal with this world therefore need very efficient strategies first to encode the components, the symbols, and then mainly to encode the relations that determine the final shape of the objects that are composed of these tiny components, atoms or letters, or in the visual world, different features. Now, the simplest way to encode relations, and this has been exploited by nature over and over again, is to generate conjunction-specific units that encode particular constellations of components. And we call this strategy a chunking strategy or a labeled line strategy, labeled line codes. They are realized in virtually all natural systems, in all nervous systems, and they are also the prevailing principle in artificial systems like the deep learning networks that have become so famous recently. Here is <clears throat> the most simple version of it. It's the classical perceptron network. Uh, at the input stage, you have feature selective uh, detectors that detect item A and item B. And if you want to have a representation of the conjunction of A and B, these these networks do it in the following way. They distribute through divergent and convergent connections activity on an intermediate layer of nodes, the so-called hidden layer. And their output connections are formed to readout neurons. Let's call them conjunction-specific neurons, which once one has arranged the right convergence patterns and the appropriate gain of these connections, one arrives at a state where the unit C fires only and only if A and B are simultaneously the case. So it's a conjunction-specific coincidence-detecting unit that, when activated, tells subsequent stages, output neurons perhaps, that A and B have been there simultaneously. And exactly the same principle is iterated over many, many layers in the now so 
popular deep learning networks. You have an input uh, layer of receptors that um, signal a very complex vector of feature constellations, a picture, a pattern. Then activity is distributed by divergence and conversions onto many hidden layers. And finally, you have these um, output layers where conjunction-specific neurons um, become activated if a particular input vector is the case. Now, these systems have severe limitations um, in representing relations by conjunction-specific units because this strategy leads to a combinatorial explosion of the hardware. You need a huge number of nodes in order to accommodate the virtually infinite variety of relations that components can have with each other. Then it is very difficult in such systems to decode uh, temporal relations because they have no memory. And they have problems in handling novel constellations because they are not generative. They can only discover what they have learned in countless trials usually when that pro propagation is used in order to optimize the uh, feedforward architectures. Now, these limitations can be overcome by the flexible association of components uh, in recurrent networks. In this case, <coughs> units which represent components, they get transiently bound through cooperative interactions into a um, coherent representation of this particular constellation of features. Now, this requires recurrent interactions, it requires cooperativity, and therefore a completely different network architecture. Let me give you an example. Uh, in case you have features A, B, and C, and you want to signal to some subsequent layer uh, that features A and B and C are related to one another, then one possibility is to establish cooperative interactions between detectors A, B, and C, or nodes A, B, and C, and structure their activity in a, in a way that can be recognized by all the subsequent layers that they are belonging together transiently. If you want to signal a different constellation of features, just have a different pattern of cooperativity. So the gist of this strategy is that the same nodes, the same feature representing neurons or columns in the cortex can signal quite different constellations of features depending on the way in which they cooperate. This greatly economizes on hardware because with, as with the alphabet, a limited number of uh, representing symbols can, in different constellations, express a, a very large number of different uh, relational constructs. So, this dynamic encoding of relations can, of course, only be realized in recurrent networks. But this is not a problem because they are abundant in natural systems. You find them in the hippocampus, you find them in cerebral cortex, you don't find them in the cerebellum, interestingly enough. And here is a scheme, very simplified, of uh, two cortical columns. Let's say it's visual cortex, they would be orientation selective columns. Um, and the blue lines here are essentially standing for the feed forward pathways, the input to layer four, and then the redistribution of activity into the supergranular and infragranular layers, populated mainly by pyramidal cells with some interspersed inhibitory interneurons. They are depicted in red here. <clears throat> but the important point here is, or are these red lines. These are axon collaterals of pyramidal cells that traverse tangentially to the cortical lamination and interconnect columns reciprocally. They come from excitatory neurons and they impinge on the dendrites of the other excitatory neurons. Also, they, and I have not traced this here, they contact inhibitory interneurons with about the frequency with which they occur. About 20% of all the cells here are inhibitory. These connections are extremely abundant. They make up much more of the synapses than any of these feedforward connections in the columns. Now, a very important feature of these feed, of these recurrent connections is that they are endowed with Hebbian synapses. They um, show a synaptic plasticity according to a correlation rule, and they 
increase their gain between um, neurons that they interconnect that have a high probability of being activated in temporal contingency. It's a correlation rule that dominates heavy and synaptic modification, whether it is uh, spike timing dependent plasticity or modifications of that. This means that the synaptic weight distributions of these tangential connections will reflect the correlation structure of sensory environments. Columns that very often get activated simultaneously because the features they stand for, or let, let me call the columns nodes, um, co-occur very frequently in the, in the outer world. So the statistical irregularities of the outer world with experience get imprinted in the weight distributions of these lateral connections, reciprocal connections, thus creating an internal model of the world or capturing priors. And I will come back to this very important point. <clears throat> Let me give you an example for the shaping process taken from very old experiments that we did somewhere in the, in the 19th of the last century. Um, and this is the shaping of these connections by experience. Um, here's how the experiments goes. One <clears throat> cuts a window in the skull to visualize the surface of the visual cortex in this case, then uses the intrinsic signal in order to determine the functional properties of the columnar system, in this case orientation selectivity, and then inject fluorescent dyes into these patches, which will then be transported retrogradely to the parent cells sitting somewhere. So the question is, where are these parent cells sitting? If in a normally raised animal, and this is kittens, one does this experiment, one finds that upon injection, like here in this patch, and there's another one with a yellow injection, I can't see it in the moment. Anyway, it's also in one of these black patches. You see that the cells projecting to these places are distributed with extremely high selectivity in patches, i.e. columns, that share the same, in this case, a functional property, in this case, orientation selectivity. It also works for ocular, ocularity, the same thing. If, however, the animal is deprived of vision early on, has no visual experience, which means that the activity of these columns is not determined by the um, covariance of the features in the outer world, but is just spontaneously active, there's absolutely no order in these patchy patterns. You see these green dots, retrograde traces distributed over the black and the white surfaces equally, meaning that the architecture of these connections is becoming selective because of experience by an experience dependent or activity dependent or use dependent pruning process. So their architecture and also the weight distribution of these connections because they can also be strong or weak is reflecting uh, regularities of the outer world. So it's reflecting knowledge about the structure of the outer world. So one can <clears throat> sketch the cortical connectivity in this very simple way, and this is only holding for super granular layers. We have columns or nodes that are feature selective, and I won't talk much about it, but they all have a propensity to oscillate because the intrinsic circuitry of these columns is made up of, of uh, Ricard inhibition, the so-called ping circuits, which uh, have the propensity to oscillate when activated, as all recurrent networks like to uh, get into resonance and oscillate. And these columns are reciprocally coupled uh, with the connections you have just seen, these tangential horizontal connections in the visual cortex. And the coupling in general has a, a space constant that decays exponentially with distance. But because of this, experience-dependent pruning, there is selective enhancement and stabilization of connections that interconnect nodes which respond to features that have a high probability to co-occur co in the outer world. So there is a lot of knowledge about the statistical structure of the outer world stored in the weight distributions of this recurrent network. Now, and this will become important later, 
input is coming from the thalamus and distributed on these nodes, <coughs> activating only a subset of nodes at any one moment in time, because as I said, they are feature selective. And then these nodes project feed forward to the next layer that is organized in very much the same way, because secondary and tertiary and higher order visual areas have exactly the same intrinsic structure, except that the, the grain is different, the, convert, the degree of convergence of the input fibers is different. Um, so keep this scheme in mind because it will become important again. So the consequence of this anisotropic coupling now is that nodes or columns that code for frequently occurring feature constellations, they will cooperate preferentially because they are more coupled than others. This means that their discharges will become more correlated, either could vary more in their modulation of discharge rate, or they be, could become active in, in, with a higher degree of synchrony. Both are possible. And this dynamic association, which is due to a self-organizing cooperative nonlinear interaction, allows for the flexible and very context-dependent association of columns, i.e. the encoding of relations. And this copes with the combinatorial problem because columns can be recombined in very, very different and very many constellations depending on context. And because this network is continuously coupled, the global context matters. It can take into account the plethora of features in a cluttered scene and establish, evaluate the relations and based on the internally stored knowledge, um, group neuron or nodes in clusters that correspond to maybe objects or the components of objects. So we know that the labeled line code, which is realized in feedforward architectures and leads to conjunction specific neurons, does coexist with this uh, recurrent coding because cortical networks are recurrent. So I now want to briefly illustrate how these two relational encoding strategies can peacefully coexist. And the solution is that the synchronization patterns or the cooperation patterns or coherence patterns that reflect relatedness in the recurrent network influence in turn the selection of conjunction specific units at the next level. So there is a nice alternation between rate codes which are used by the conjunction detecting neurons, the label line code, and the temporal code, which is a relational temporal code in the recurrent network. And this is how one can imagine this thing. Here's a, a network with one layer. Let's say this is V1 uh, with nodes responding to different features, A, B, and C, and uh, they are reciprocally coupled. And this particular network had experienced um, in prior life or with perceptual learning immediately before, that features B and C tend to be related because they occur very frequently together. Now, imagine that features A, B, and C are simultaneously present, driving A, B, and C to the, with the same rates, the same amplitude. So they are simply active at the same level. These neurons then project forward, let's say, to V2, again with divergence and convergence, as we have seen it in the deep learning networks. And there be always the same synaptic weights of these connections, which in reality is certainly not true, but let's assume it's the case. Two target cells, D, E, and F. Now, they are all equally active. They are all connected to the following neurons in the same way, and the weights are all the same. But because these two coordinate their discharges, because of this enhanced reciprocal cooperative interaction, to make them either more um, um, coincident, more synchronous, which is probably the case, or they could also just become more active for, because of these cooperative interactions, for which is also some evidence, then the consequence will be that in this case, only neurons E and F with appropriate thresholding in the following layer will become active. This one doesn't see coordinated input, just gets the same um, rate drive as all the others but they will be ignited more because of the 
uh, either more synchronous or simultaneously enhanced activity of those two cooperating units. Now the next work, let's next network network had a different experience. Its experience was that A and B are more frequently related in the outer world. And in this case, they will cooperate more easily than B and C, and this will lead to selective activation of D and E. So you can see how this um, relation encoding mechanism that relies on dynamic grouping of neurons impinges in the feedforward network and ignites different sets of conjunction-specific neurons. So the two codes can coexist, and it, it looks as if they did, because they have very different uh, and complementary advantages. This one is flexible, can take context into account, because the cooperativity between A and B is not only determined by the coupling strength between them, but also by all the other reciprocal interactions between all the nodes that I haven't shown here. So context also determines who is going to, to um, cooperate with whom at any one moment in time. So one prediction of this is that neurons that respond to groupable features, that is, to features that mutually predict one another, yeah, should engage in more cooperative, more correlated, more synchronized discharges. And here's the evidence. Um, very recently, Alina Peter um, in, in, at the EASY, uh, together with many groups who provided data for this wonderful example uh, experiment and evaluated by, by uh, Martin Wink, um, found that responses to homogeneous colored surfaces mutually predict one another. So if there is a, a large colored surface, all columns that respond to the same color, uh, they will predict one another's responses. They will say, I see blue, you see blue, we all see blue. If there is no dividing line, uh, there is a contextual prediction that what the receptive field of an individual neuron will see is blue. In this case, the predictions are derived from the embedding context, and they are, also, of course, mediated by the selective recurrent connections uh, among columns sharing particular color preferences. So here is the experiment. Monkey fixates a fixation spot. The receptive fields uh, that are recorded by the electrodes, it was matrix, matrix electrodes, we used the Charlie Gray drive. They are located at some eccentricity of the fixation spot. And um, then there is a monochromatic uh, single color surface project, projected over the receptive fields. And this produces, quite surprisingly, a very, very strong increase of oscillatory, i.e. highly synchronous activity, in this case in the 50 hertz range, so it's the gamma frequency range. This is not the case if one shows just a white surface, because apparently, Brightness is not interpreted by the nervous system as a feature. It's a quality of energy, while color is taken as a feature. With an achromatic uh, homogeneous surface over the receptive fields, there's just a big, a little hump in the same frequency range. Um, and um, this is the 1 over F distribution of uh, resting state activity that one usually sees. So this is a surprising amount or increase of synchrony. And if one correlates the discharge rate of the neurons that are activated by this homogeneous surface with the phase of these oscillations, one sees a very, very precise phase locking indicating those, that those neurons have been activated simultaneously and were discharging in synchrony, in, this, uh, in synchrony with these oscillations. Now, if one counts the rates of these neurons, something very different is observed. If one shows a homogeneous surface, uniform colored, this is the rate increase of the neurons responding to the stimulus. There is a transient peak, but then there is a, a drop of discharge rate below the baseline while the stimulus is still on. Very different situation is seen if the receptive field stimulus has another color than the predicting surround. So if the prediction 
derived from the surround is not confirmed by the, in this case, the feature, the color of the center stimulus, then one gets a very strong rate increase that is sustained over a long period of time. And one does get exactly the same result if one breaks the continuity between the embedding surround and the receptive field proper. So just by interpolating a, a, a blank ring or a dark ring, a contour, um, if one then uh, stimulates even with the same color within, uh, one does get, um, again, this very strong rate increase because the prediction traveling from the surround to the center is disrupted. And um, inversely related to the strong rate increase is the amount of synchrony. In the cases of the blob, this case, or uh, the analus, uh, the red, this case, there is very little increase in synchrony compared to the uniform um, stimulus. Leading to the conclusion of speculation that discharge rates and synchrony can code for quite different aspects. And in this case, one would say the discharge rate signals the surprise or the salience of the receptive field center stimulus or its mismatch um, with the contextual prediction, i.e. the uh, predictions derived from the surround. So if the sensory evidence doesn't match the predictions derived from these lateral interactions, there is a strong decrease in rate, increase in rate. However, if there is a good match, uh, synchronization increases, but discharge rates increase only very little and even drop below baseline after um, the initial transient phase. So let me now come to part two, um, which is uh, focusing on the fact that recurrent oscillator networks um, provide computational op options that are go, go far beyond the encoding of relations that we have been talking about till now. And the reason is that such networks generate a very high dimensional dynamic state space that can be exploited for computations. And this principle is exploited also in a subclass of artificial neuronal networks, the so-called recurrent networks. And it got known under the label reservoir computing or echo-state computing or liquid computing. And pioneers in this field were Wolfgang Maas and Buonamo and Jaeger. Uh, now, I can unfortunately not ask you how many of you are familiar with this concept, so I will just uh, briefly um, allude to it again. Um, imagine a pond of water being silent. And then one throws in stones at different times, at different places, with different impact and different sizes into this pond. And each of the impacts will create a traveling wave uh, that spreads in the water. And these waves will cause very, very complex interference patterns. And they will outlast um, the the duration of the impact, uh, depending on the viscosity of the liquid for quite some time. So as long as the liquid is vibrating, is oscillating, shows this interference pattern, there is a memory in this liquid. Liquid, And when one calls this memory fading memory because after a while it, it, it wipes out, it goes away when this, the pond is again still. And one can show that by measuring at two or three places in this pond, the amplitude, the wavelength, and the frequency of these oscillations, interference patterns, one can reconstruct very, very precisely the sequence of events that happened and gave rise to this particular pattern. One can use machine learning techniques um, and then show that one can decipher um, the sequence of events very precisely from a snapshot of the actual interference patterns. So the trick here is, one transforms a low dimensional input pattern, the impact of these various stones, into a very high dimensional interference pattern, then uses uh, a few uh, variables of this interference pattern, phase, amplitude, and um, wavelength, um, to decode uh, what has happened in the low dimensional space before. Uh, now, it so happens that the recurrent networks 
do have properties very similar to those liquids. Um, this is why this uh, strategy is called uh, reservoir computing or liquid computing, because um, the dynamics in a recurrently coupled network are very similar. If one um, perturbs the liquid, um, the node on one uh, place through these reciprocal connections, there will be traveling waves, and if one disturbs two or three nodes in a row, one gets these interference patterns. So you have already seen one can produce a very high dimensional space um, by these interference patterns in the spatial temporal domain. And this allows, in principle, for the storage of an enormous amount of information. It allows for parallel search, you will see an example later, and ultra fast readout of these patterns. Also, because of the high dimensionality of the state space, there is a very good separation of representations that in low dimensional space would be superimposed and could not be classified with a linear classifier. But in this high dimensional space, they, they get segregated sufficiently so that they can be classified even with a linear classifier, so with a, a separatrix plane. And as you saw, they exhibit fading memory due to the reverberation in this system. And this makes these systems ideally suited to encode sequences because they can integrate uh, over temporarily disjunct uh, events. So one can derive predictions from this scheme and can then test them experimentally. And this is what the last 15 minutes of my talk will all be about. One prediction is that resting activity should exhibit a very high dimensional correlation structure uh, because it reflects all the priors, the weight distributions that are stored in these recurrent connections. Uh, so it's a very anisotropic coupling, and when the system is spontaneously active, and we know it is, and its activity is close to criticality for the specialists, uh, the expected activity will be very, very high dimensional. So latently harboring all the priors that this system has learned uh, throughout its life. Then the prediction is that stimuli that match those priors, they should induce, constrain the dynamics of the system and induce lower dimensional substates, like specific correlation patterns that are stimulus specific or synchronization patterns, coherence patterns of a lower dimensionality. And these substates, once they have converged, they should be equivalent already with the result of this basin matching operations between sensory evidence and stored priors. So they solve the matching problem of how to compare sensory evidence with stored priors in a dynamic and highly flexible way. So how does one test these predictions? One does, of course, need multi-site recordings from many, as many nodes as possible. Then one presents stimulus sequences to test for fading memory, for example, and superposition of information. And then one uses machine learning techniques to retrieve stimulus-specific information in these high-dimensional response vectors that one gets if one records from many nodes simultaneously. So here is how it goes. Put a device above the cortex that allows you to insert as many electrodes as possible. In our case, it was either silicon probes with uh, 32 uh, hotspots each. Putting two of them gives you something like 60 recording sites. Or the Charlie Gray drive, which has 32 electrodes that remain adjustable, which is very nice. And then one gets a crowd of receptive fields from the neurons, mostly of superimposed, and then presents stimuli. In our case, we used and these are experiments from CATS that I show in the next two slides. We used letters of the Latin alphabet and numbers. So you get these high dimensional vectors. Each line here, dot line, is a, a recording site, is an electrode. Each dot is a spike. And we showed letters A, B, or C, each 100 millisecond long in a sequence. Then convolved the time point processes here with a sawtooth function to get continuous signals, and then trained a classifier um, on test set uh, 
so that the classifier discovered at a particular moment in time was trained that the first stimulus was an A or the second stimulus was a B. And then we looked at the classification performance. Could the classifier detect from these high dimensional vectors within a short time window, 50 milliseconds, what the stimulus was? And here is what we found. Here is classification performance plotted on the ordinate. Yes, the classifier performs very well. With some latency after presentation of the first stimulus, there is 80, 90 percent classification performance that outlasts the stimulus sometimes if there is no further disturbance up to 500 milliseconds or a second. And then it fades away. So this is fading memory. One <clears throat> can then show a second stimulus, um, a different stimulus, and at a particular moment in time after the second stimulus started to produce responses, um, one can classify both the first and the second stimulus from the same activity vector with quite high reliability and also the sequence order, whether the first stimulus was an A or a C and whether the second stimulus was a B or a D. So uh, there must have been some nonlinear transformation in the network already in order to allow a linear classifier to detect this XOR function. So information about two subsequent stimuli can be superimposed in the network and one can decode from the vectors of the activity of the nodes that one records at a particular moment in time, uh, the first stimulus and the second stimulus. Summary, information is apparently distributed across many neurons. There is fading memory. Persistence of information across stimuli can be seen. There is superposition of information from different stimuli, like in this pond. And there is preservation of sequence order in these vectors. So these results, which we have obtained somewhere in 2009, together with Wolfgang Maas and Danko Nikolic, they supported the working hypothesis that then led to further inquiry and further predictions. Now, one other prediction is that if stimulus-specific substates self-organize on the basis of stored priors, the classifiability of these vectors should improve with reverberation once the network can add its own knowledge. And the second prediction is, um, if one presents many, many stimuli in a row, the network through um, non-supervised learning, which we also call perceptual learning, um, should improve its classification ability for these familiar stimuli. And both seems to be the case. Um, here is the discharge rate uh, of the neurons in the beginning of the experiment to uh, letter A, let's say. And at the end of the experiment, after the animal had seen maybe a thousand times this letter, and there is only very little difference in discharge rate, maybe a little bit stronger and longer lasting reverberating activity in the network. Um, if one tests for classification performance, you see that it is not so good in the initial transient phase of the discharge. This is here, this is when the stimulus is present, but it gets much better later on in the reverberating phase of the activity, i.e. at a time when the network had already a possibility to contribute its own knowledge, its anisotropic coupling to the formation of the substate that is then classified. And this um, classification gets better for the late phase of the experiment when the animal had seen already so many stimuli. The reason is that in PC space, if one does a principal component analysis, as time goes on after presentation of the stimulus, uh, when the network starts to reverberate, the um, principal components of these characteristic for the various letters, stimuli, they segregate in high D space, here down projected on a two-dimensional space. So, um, I think I can sp skip these conclusions. You got it. Let me go to the next prediction. Uh, the prediction was, if priors that are acquired by perceptual learning, so by the running in of the uh, weight distributions of these horizontal connections according to a correlation rule, if they are really stored in the synaptic weight distributions of the recurrent network, then the spontaneous activity of this network should change its covariance structure 
and um, should perhaps replay some of these imprinted um, substates. So Andrea Lazar trained an array of 12 by 12 um, classifiers uh, to reproduce the brightness values <laughs> decoded from the vectors to a particular stimulus given to the animal. So if showing an F, the classifiers are supposed to reproduce this sort of brightness distribution. And they did this quite well after sufficient training. And this allowed her then to use those classifiers in, uh, in, a, in a sliding window procedure, move them over the stretches of spontaneous activity. And what she saw is that every now and then, spontaneous activity replayed the vector that was characteristic for one of these stimuli. Sometimes it produced something that was not so clearly uh, identifiable, but the test run was to show a real letter and then do the decoding, and here is how the classifiers perform when they, show, when they see a, a really evoked pattern. So this means that cortical networks do remember stimulus-specific substates, and they can replay them spontaneously. And the putative mechanism is that there are use dependent changes in the synaptic weights of these recurrent connections. And there is evidence for this from simulation studies that are, have been done in self organizing recurrent networks. And Andrea Lazar has worked a lot in, in this, also uh, Johann Trisch, some together, uh, which shows that indeed by uh, training these networks, inducing differential changes in the recurrent connections between nodes, they can learn about. Uh, particular patterns and transform them then into um, classifiable substates, dynamically substates. Okay, maybe this will be the last prediction I come to. If the statistical relationship of natural environments are really stored in the weights of the recurrent connections, then natural scenes should induce substates that contain more information than those induced by scrambled scenes or scenes in which one has destroyed some of the regularities of natural scenes. And the, the variable that one measures is the classifiability of the substates that one gets. So here is the experiment, again, uh, done in monkey, awake, fixating, presented with natural images or their uh, face distorted uh, counterparts. Same energy. And here is the classification performance of a linear classifier. Um, a naive Bayesian classifier that was fed with the, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> that was wind, with the activity vectors of um, um, cortical neurons recorded uh, from 32 different sites. And this shows that the classification performance taken from these vectors after stimulus onset, um, stimulus was about one second long, um, is much higher for natural images than it is for these scrambled, denaturalized images. And this is not due to changes in firing rate because it is virtually identical. It is not due to changes in signal-to-noise ratio because the Fano factor that is reduced by stimulation is reduced to the same extent with natural images and artificial images. So this means that if stimuli um, corresponds to the stored um, yeah, priors, which are expressed most likely in the weight distributions of the tangential connections. They produce substates that have a much more succinct correlation structure than uh, if they were induced by less ordered or if, if there's less good match between the sensory evidence and the internal uh, structure. Um, similar to what you saw with respect to oscillations in the color experiment, one sees that if one stimulates with uh, natural uh, stimuli and deduces the classification performance now, not from um, discharge rates, but from the amplitudes of gamma oscillations, which are an expression of correlation structure. The more correlated, the higher the amplitude of these field potentials because it's there's better summation, natural images also can be classified much better because these oscillations are more succinct, have larger amplitude, 
and apparently contain more stimulus-specific information, meaning that there is something in the correlation structure that the uh, classifier can pick up and that increases its performance if the stimulus or the sensory evidence matches the stored priors. So, um, in summary, and then I will be done, uh, classification of scenes is possible both from spike and LFP vectors. Classification is better for natural than scrambled schemes. Difference is not attributable to change in signal to noise ratio. Natural scenes induce CRISPR correlation patterns, or one gets CRISPR correlation patterns if sensory evidence matches well. Um, predictions, predictions derived either from context or from prior experience. And they lead, and I won't show you the data, to a stronger reduction of dimensionality of these substates. So the proposal is a good match between sensory evidence and stored priors leads to well-organized, temporarily structured substates that have a very specific correlation structure. Uh, I have to skip that evidence, but uh, there is a paper by, um, I think, Andrea is last author, and. Uh, Yargi Orban from Budapest is a leading author, uh, and Michal is a first author. Uh, they analyzed the correlation structure of patterns induced by natural and artificial or face scrambled images and um, showed that uh, there is a more succinct correlation structure in the vectors generated by matching stimuli. So, the general conclusions. And then I come to the end, is that the dynamics of recurrent networks allow for very powerful computations. And that this is perhaps the reason for the evolutionary success of recurrent networks that you find um, everywhere, not only in, in uh, vertebrate brains, but you see them also, in, there are invertebrate solutions to the same problem. Now, how should one proceed in order to nail down this hypothesis more? It requires, of course, massive parallel recording because you want to record from as many nodes as possible. And then, for sure, we need novel mathematical techniques because we have to cope with very high-dimensional, non-stationary activity vectors. And we have to look for correlation patterns that are certainly of higher order than just pairwise correlations. And uh, my gut feeling is that we are still at the very beginning of this, but that this will be a fruitful path to pursue. And um, I haven't shown you data in progress that uh, also delineate other interesting properties of recurrent networks, namely their ability to produce sequences of activity um, and to encode stimulus-specific information in the sequence of activated nodes. So node A, we, firing before node B and node C and node D at particular times and the sequence of this sequential activation uh, contains a lot of stimulus-specific information which can also be used for coding. And then I didn't talk about all the virtues that one can get if the nodes are oscillatory uh, or damped or have the propensity to oscillate because then one can also exploit phase space. And because conduction velocities in cortex are very anisotropic, there is yet another variable that needs to be explored. How does that affect substates if the communication between nodes um, occurs with delay and with a variable delay? So with this, I want to leave you and thank particularly those who did the work. Uh, this is uh, Katarina Shepko who was involved, Johanna Klon-Lipok, who did most of the experimental work. She is a biological uh, diploma student, or she, she did a diploma in biology, but she works as technical assistant, but she does virtually all the recording and um, also the surgery in the monkey. She's a wonderful collaborator. Andrea Lazar, I have mentioned several times. Yiling, he works on the sequences now and also works um, on the delayed magic to sample task that I haven't been talking about. Liane Klein uh, collected much of the data that I have been showing you about the monkeys and uh, the Orban lab that I talked about in Budapest. This is uh, Gergo Orban. Um, they contributed the mathematics to analysis to the analysis of the correlation structure. So, thank you very much. I'm done and I'm ready to take questions. Good.
thank you very much for the great talk. It was very interesting. Uh, we can now start with the most upvoted questions. And the first one is uh, from Alexandra Witt. She asks, do you think the remaining priors from the concurrent activity could be considered evidence for predictive voting? Yes, of course. Voting? This is the gist of it. And it, I, I think what, what I told you provides a mechanism of how in predictive coding century evidence can be matched with in, in installed priors. Um, and the, the conundrum is or has always been, how is it possible to have so many priors um, superimposed on each other, stored in a huge memory store, and grab them out after each saccade when new century evidence becomes available. So within a fraction of a second, the uh, century evidence can be compared with the appropriate prior, which is read out, pulled out of the storage. Uh, and uh, I think this mechanism can solve that conundrum because you can't do this, solve this problem with a, with a serial uh, search for uh, priors in a in whatever state, space, or, or in a list. But here, uh, these recurrent networks allow simultaneous and parallel access to all the stored knowledge in a, in a very global way. And the collapse from the hoovering spontaneous activity, this is, which is very high dimensional, um, and contains latently all the information that is stored in the anisotropy of this network, um, can then be read out by the sensory evidence itself in a self-organizing process by this collapse into a lower dimension substate um, in a fraction of a second. So maybe this is how it works. It certainly has to do with predictive coding, yeah. Okay, uh, the next question is from Jaime. He asks, does the binding of different features into the percept of an object could depend solely on the intrinsic con connectivity properties? It would have to be, but it's certainly not all achieved already in primary visual cortex, because uh, the sketch I gave you was just uh, one cortical layer or one cortical area, and then there was the next, maybe from V1 to V2, but we know that we have all this processing hierarchy, where in the way up, the convergence and divergence patterns change all the time, producing higher granularity or lower granularity with these very large receptive fields and inferior temporal cortex. But the principle within the respective cortical areas should be more or less the same because they are all built in the same way. Um, they have these layer two, three recurrent collaterals. They get the feed forward input into their respective layer four. If, if they have a granular cortex. So, yes, I think um, it is, yeah, and then there are, I didn't talk about those at all, the massive feedback loops from higher cortical areas to lower cortical areas. And this whole system is permanently active. So, if something happens in IT, it will be immediately seen in V1 and vice versa. So, they continuously talk to each other and evaluate in parallel what their respective task is. The task being defined by the architecture of the feedforward connections and, uh, the, of course, also the intrinsic connections, which I guess there's no work done on learning of intrinsic connections beyond V1. Neither is there any work done on uh, learning heavy and synapses in the feedback connections from upstairs. Um, they all have NMDA receptors. They, they should be adaptive, but it hasn't been pinned point. Yeah. There's, there's some, some work by Miyashita in inferior temporal cortex suggesting that, yes, when you learn about paired associates, you learn uh, this learning occurs there and must somehow depend on heavy mechanisms at that level. But, yeah. Okay, next question is from Alexander Dieter. Uh, he asks, neuronal coding often is tuned to change as neurons adapt to constant repetitive stimuli and a change of stimulus evokes stronger responses. If I understood you correctly, stored experience dependent synaptic weights amplify slash support predicted that is learned stimuli to activate networks in a more synchronized or detectable manner. Could you speculate about the mechanisms which would interrupt this coding 
and allow for new unexpected memories? Well, I, I hope I showed you that the unexpected information, the, the predict, predictive error, um, leads to strong rate increases. Um, now, this your question probably addresses what is going to change synaptic gain. Um, I skipped evidence, but you can look it up in a recent publication. First author is Galuske, last author is myself, and PNAS just came out, um, showing that synaptic gain of these tangential connections is changed when the network engages in highly synchronized substates characterized by strong gamma synchrony. But um, you could as well change synapses um, by a high frequency volume of activity, because this is also what uh, yeah. reaches the threshold of NMDA receptor conductances, can trigger calcium spikes in the dendrites. So you have both signatures, the matching signature, which is a high degree of coincident firing, and the surprise signature, which is a strong discharge rate, uh, induce synaptic gain changes. I guess the error will induce changes mainly in the feedforward connections and the synchrony mainly, but it's an empirical question we have to see. Good, thank you. The next question is from uh, Pierce Kern. He asks, uh, would neuroscience benefit from studying the statistics of natural stimuli more extensively before performing neurophysiological studies? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I think if you think back in the in the history, when Hubel Wiesel came up with showing us receptive fields, calling them simple or complex, when um, they were defined by sweeping a isolated light bar over the receptive field. Uh, this is how the canonical terminology of cortical receptive fields has been uh, determined. Later on, there have been attempts to reconstruct the structure of a receptive field by showing um, a complex cluttered scene and sweeping it over the receptive field over and over again and averaging, trying to reconstitute because you knew which contour was crossing the receptive field at which moment in time. And it turned out that it was extremely difficult and that this receptive field didn't look very much like the ones you get if you stimulate with an oriented bar because they are so extremely context sensitive. So um, we had a recent workshop on progress in <laughs> cortical physiology. And I think the group I was in came to the conclusion that um, the concept of a receptive field is, a, is one that should question, one should question. That there may be not be such a thing as a stable receptive field. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, the next question is from Moen, and he hasn't specified whether he wants to come on the screen, so I will ask for him. Uh, you interestingly pointed out that a larger recurrent interneuronal synchrony causes a more efficient bottom-up transmission. Do we expect that the higher frequency, meaning a more temporal synchronicity, the synchrony occurs in a with an equal strength of coupling may lead to a better communication. Yeah, I think there is there is a lot of evidence. We had one talk this morning actually uh, on uh, whether cortical neurons function like uh, coincidence detectors, and they obviously do. Uh, there are two ways to try to impress a neuron. Uh, one is to um, increase your discharge frequency of your input to that neuron. Um, that is very often hampered by the fact that there's frequency adaptation of the release mechanism. The EPSPs get smaller and smaller and smaller, so you can't increase frequency uh, ad libitum without losing effect. And, and the other prominent uh, mechanism is, of course, if you have two synapses uh, nearby, uh, if they are synchronously active, they will have a much stronger input as if they are temporarily dispersed. Uh, and this is true for all, all inputs. Um, I think there's an old paper by Bruno and Sackmann showing that a single geniculate neuron, a thalamic neuron, would never be able to drive a cortical neuron unless it would synchronize with its neighbors and produce 
uh, a, a synchronous volley of input. Thank you very much. I think we're out of time now, and we do have a few more questions which are very interesting. Maybe you all could email him. Yeah, yeah. If you have my email, yeah, sure. <laughs> Publicly available. Good. So we we'll see Tara again at six o'clock. Yes. Thank you very much for the great talk uh, and the great answers. We will see each other in the panel discussion and looking forward to seeing you all in the next session then. Yeah. Thank bye you. Bye. bye. bye.